Welcome everyone. My name is Kamal Manocha. I represent PMS AIF World Platform. We had set up this platform three and a half years ago to continuously keep learning and keep imparting knowledge to the entire ecosystem, focusing in the space of alternatives. And we are very proudly keeping that process going on. Today we have a very interesting, you know, uh, guest with us. Uh, Mr. Karthik Atharya, who heads the fixed income space at Sundram Alternates. Of late, over the last two weeks, big changes have been announced, you know, which impact debt mutual fund industry. Debt mutual fund industry is a very large industry in terms of AUMs, and hence, you know, this impact is big. Also, since this, you know, uh, impact is long term, you know, it changes the fixed income space through debt mutual funds forever. And hence, it is important to enhance our knowledge and understand that what are the other alternates, you know, which are ahead of us, which provide equally great opportunities for investors to take the debt side of their portfolio seriously, because in the context of asset allocation, debt plays equally important role. And all of us understand that asset allocation itself determines 90% of portfolio's returns. So, you know, we would want to discuss in this webinar the perspective that an alternatives, you know, fixed income fund manager has toward, towards this change which has been announced. And also, obviously, you know, we are going to discuss in detail one very credible solution, you know, through uh, Sundaram Alternates team because they have years of experience in managing fixed income space through category two credit opportunities funds. And they have been uh, you know launching up with various offerings in the past which have given good returns good experience to you know their clients and they have you know one very great offering at the moment which is ongoing and we would want to reason it out through q a in this entire detailed conversation throughout this webinar welcome uh, karthik you know for this webinar on this friday evening and you know before i hand over to you I would want to give, I would want you to kind of give a perspective on this big change, which has been announced in the mutual fund industry and how do you see it? And then, you know, what are your, I would say, uh, answers to some of the investors uh, in this regards? Uh, thank you very much, Kamal. And thank you to PMS AIF World for giving us this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here this Friday evening. Uh, so it's a great topic to start this uh, conversation off. Um, I must preface that as Sundaram, <clears throat> any of our products on the credit side have never been structured for tax or keeping in view a tax arbitrage. But having said that, uh, this is a pretty substantial change. In fact, uh, to your point, it uh, it is not just the debt mutual fund taxation, you know, that is uh, you know coming into play. Although that is a pretty substantial change. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the debt mutual fund industry is, you know, close to 40 lakh crores, you know, roughly 50 billion US. So it's a pretty sizable, um, I would say, harbor, you know, for many clients to, you know, look at playing rates, uh, look at playing quality, um, you know, all with the with the support, you know, of the tax rules that were there, you know, till about a week ago. Uh, but it is clear that in this current, um, you know, regime. Um, Central banks, um, governments are increasingly taking a view um, that, you know, for them, um, it is a playoff between um, a financial product investment opportunity as well as macro market uh, parameters like liquidity, uh, you know, the overall uh, rates, currency environment and so on and so forth. So um, if you see even starting a month ago or a month and a half ago, maybe slightly earlier than that, you know, there have been regulations which one can consistently see in terms of a trend that are seeking to do away, you know, with tax arbitrage, whether it is the MLD market, <clears throat> whether it is a debate on, uh, you know, SCT and so on and so forth, you know, the mutual fund debt taxation, of course, is a big one. So there is a consistent trend in terms of uh, making this a level playing field. Um, and clearly, um, the you know, if I were to absorb as an investor a signal, you know, it is uh, look at your investments, look at your portfolio allocation, look at your risk thresholds, um, play more the strategy 
uh, rather than trying to play macro if you want to play macro then you know there are various you know equity strategies whether it's the nifty the indexes and so on and so forth you know try and be mark to market uh, but if you want to play specific strategies and try and get any form of alpha you know whether that is 50 bips or 500 bips um, you know you really need to start committing towards the strategy is is really i think the message that uh, the regulator is uh, giving so from that perspective um, you know we ourselves of course the immediate gut reaction is to look at um, you know there's a massive potential shift you know and we ourselves in our current fundraise are seeing a, a, a sudden allocation or you know new demand from investors we haven't heard from before you know who have decided to move from debt mutual funds into our corporate credit funds uh, but from if you if I were to step back and say um, you know over a longer period of time, um, I am sure you know debt debt mutual funds as an industry uh, is prevalent elsewhere in the world. It's not a unique proposition as far as India is concerned. So I think the debt mutual fund industry will also evolve um, and come up with products you know that are not necessarily depending on um, some form of form of a support from a tax arbitrage point of view. Um, they will start to play perhaps similar things in terms of quality, um, rates, and so on and so forth, and liquidity, um, but, you know, from, you know, more of a risk-adjusted return perspective. So, uh, you know, that is as a trend here to stay, um, and it is indeed a big change. So from that point of view, we can, over the next year or two, or maybe 18, 24 months, see, uh, you know, quite a substantial or a dramatic change, perhaps, in asset allocations within investors, and, you know, we are you know, witnessing that at this point in time. Uh, but on the flip side, I think it is a tremendous opportunity for, um, you know, investment managers, uh, AMCs uh, to innovate, come up with products that stand on its own sort of strength and merit, um, you know, that are able to deliver risk adjusted returns. There is a consistency and a discipline that managers use, uh, you know, so as to not take advantage of short term supports, whether they are market oriented or whether they are regulation oriented. So from that point of view, um, you know, I think that many uh, of our worthwhile competitors, um, you know, whether, you know, they are banks, whether they are AMCs, uh, whether they are just boutique investment firms, um, have a tremendous opportunity ahead of them uh, to be able to structure innovative products, funds, investment avenues, especially considering that, you know, there is a proliferation in terms of new marketplaces, fintech and otherwise, um, you know, which are able to intermediate, uh, you know, between retail, institutional, family office, ultra high net, net worth, et cetera, and the product space. So um, I think it's a great opportunity is the way I would see it. But certainly from a short term point of view, it is a, you know, fair bit of a jolt, uh, you know, for investors to sort of suddenly look at, uh, you know, things like risk and credit and so on. So from that point of view, uh, I think there's, a, there's a, perhaps a short term pain but there's a long-term potential opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. And I would say, you know, uh, we are ahead of us is a new age of investing where we'll see all the more rise of alternates. And since you represent Sundaram alternates, which particularly has built a very good credibility, especially uh, in the space of credit opportunities fund in the category two space of debt funds. And since, you know, the solution of uh, uh, this change lies in this particular category. This particular webinar is devoted to understanding this category in detail in terms of risks, in terms of rewards, in terms of taxation, in terms of you know how, who and how uh, you know uh, this uh, product category should be understood and who are right profile investors for this category. And that's where I want you to kind of you know maybe we begin by telling us the history of Sundaram Alternates in terms of the earlier products that you know you have been kind of managing and what is the experience of those clients how are the covid periods because when it comes to investing in debt investors foremost focus is risk and that's exactly you know what we also educate clients you know though clients worry too much about risk when it comes to investing in equity idly they should be worrying too much about risk when it comes to debt and hence you know i reiterate this fact you know this this particular webinar you want to focus more on understanding the process from the point of view of how has been the experience of past, past funds because we have seen in the past there have been many uncertain times, be it COVID periods or be it, you know, uh, the crisis, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say NBFC crisis that happened in 2018 19. So your funds have passed through all those crises. I know that. And in fact, you know, we had given award to Sundaram Alternates 
uh, or very recently in association with I am Ahmedabad, and those are very objective awards, and that's the reason that kind of you know drives us to do this webinar foremost with you. Obviously, we'll be doing this, these webinars with other similar players also to understand this entire space. But foremost, we are you know doing it with you to understand this entire perspective in detail. So sure. I want you to kind of you know give us the entire context of the experience so far managing Sundar alternates in the space of in the space of you know debt AIFs. Sure, Kamal. Um, and I should be very careful because I tend to get carried away when I speak about my product. Uh, but um, <clears throat> it's a very uh, interesting point that you brought up. So while we are a 75-year-old organization with a AAA pedigree as Sundaram Finance, uh, Sundaram Alternates is relatively young. In fact, um, our, we, we, we sort of uh, you know, gave birth to Sundaram Alternates exactly around the fag end of demonetization. Um, so from a timing point of view and a vintage of our funds, um, you know, we began towards the end of demonetization where there was clearly an, uh, a liquidity impact uh, especially in you know small corporates, mid corporates, real estate, you know all of where we've done business, um, and then of course you know we progressed uh, specifically from a real estate point of view to the changing regulatory regime. Of course, IBC was already there. NCLT started getting involved in terms of you know more cases coming to them, uh, more litigations, you know consumer forums, etc., getting active. Then came the Real Estate Regulation Act. Then of course you know we had the impact of GST. So a demon, a RERA, and a GST. I thought was enough in terms of liquidity impact. And then came along the NBFC crisis, you know, with the collapse of ILFS, uh, which completely dried up refinancing markets. And then, of course, you know, we had COVID, which, you know, honestly, uh, we didn't anticipate to be, uh, you know, so severe um, and certainly did not anticipate a year's lockdown of business. Um, and then, of course, we had, you know, a serious uh, second wave, you know, which had serious health impacts, especially the geographies that we operate in, which is the south of the country. Um, and then, of course, you know, we ran into a massive inflation war worldwide uh, with rising rates and so on and so forth. So you're right in the sense that, you know, it is uh, putting a saying that it, we have been through a trial by fire is putting it mildly. Uh, you know, we have been through absolute hell and you know, glad to report, of course, in that we did fairly well and came unscathed largely due to the credit, you know, of you know, the counterparties that we backed, but also, you know, our credit policies, et cetera, which I'll talk about in a minute. But just to step back. Uh, you know, clearly the, the sort of uh, beginning uh, or the thought process, you know, for us to actually begin Sundaram Alternates was we clearly felt that from a risk and an investor outlook on risk perspective, um, clearly, you know, we needed to operate in an entity that is quite different, you know, from the AMC. You know, so the AMC obviously operates the mutual funds, you know, which are largely, you know, retail in nature, small tickets, uh, you know, people park small portions of their discretionary surplus and portfolio and go in and out of funds, you know, uh, it's fairly liquid. Um, and so, whereas when you compare that with the alternate investment fund industry or even a PMS strategy, you know, which is, of course, relatively liquid, especially to deal with, uh, you know, listed instruments, whether it's debt or equity. Um, but uh, fundamentally, the risk profile and the stature of investors are very different. Uh, you know, there are obviously regulatory minimums in terms of investment, 50 lakhs and a PMS and a crore of rupees on the AIF. Uh, which are sizable, you know, when you, you know, look at uh, whether it's uh, any HNI, you know, would, would think, you know, before putting a, a crore of rupees. Of course, you know, we have HNIs putting a crore and we have HNIs who put in 15 crores and then we have family offices who've committed 25 crores and then we have institutions, um, you know, which have also, you know, contributed substantially towards our funds. But over the last five years, you know, while there was a lot of trauma and stress globally and in the country, um, it has also parallelly um, created a vast universe of investors, you know, ranging from retail to HNI, ultra HNI, to family office, you know, to banks, pension funds, even public provident funds are allowed to invest in AIF funds by way of mandate. Insurance companies, you know, which have longevity and long-term cash flows, you know, are looking at this as part of a treasury operation. Corporate treasury desks, you know, which uh, increasingly have started to think about allocating, you know, between debt mutual funds, you know, fixed income instruments as well as AIF funds. So the investor appetite, scale, and universe, you know, has massively expanded. In fact, as a reflection of that, um, the AIF industry itself is relatively young, as you know, it's about eight years old. Uh, but if I were to talk about category two, you know, which is the subject matter of this conversation, uh, which is largely the private equity and the private debt funds, uh, it's close to three lakh crores of capital committed and raised. 
you know, over the last seven, eight years, you know, which is uh, was zero. Uh, you know, so entirely a brand new asset class that is growing at 30 to 50 percent a year, um, you know, is pretty hard to ignore, you know, which is why, you know, we're seeing a lot of, you know, jumping in by SEBI into regulatory oversight, you know, making sure that, you know, funds are not mis-selling, there's ample disclosure and so on and so forth, because this is a largely, um, I would say, um, unregulated market. Um, and within that, the quantums of individual tickets have started to get bigger and bigger. So in this sort of framework, um, you know, obviously, uh, Sundaram, you know, with its AAA parentage and its outlook on risk, et cetera, when we talk about credit, um, it is credit, you know, so from that perspective, um, you know, we discussed multiple strategies uh, and wrote our business plan in 2016, where clearly we said that, you know, we're going to start with a real estate lending fund, um, you know, which you've evaluated as well, Kamal. Um, and then we said we would progress once that stabilizes into a corporate lending fund, which addresses unmet credit needs of small and mid corporate enterprises. And then, you know, we have products that are uh, in the on the verge of being launched, whether it's a corporate bond market, which again, you know, similar to everything that I described on the AIF side, is a very nascent but incredibly fast-growing market uh, in terms of depth, sophistication, marketplaces, ability to do price discovery, and so on. So that's the next part, which is the listed corporate bond universe, you know, which is very very active as a market when you look at private credit worldwide, um, and government is supporting that growth. And then you know we have you know ideas around impact and social investing. Uh, but from a credit perspective. So I think over the next five to 10 years, we are very, very clear in terms of, you know, what the business plan is, you know, how we plan to launch. Uh, you know, we also look at intrinsic group strengths from a Sundaram perspective, uh, you know, whether it's the housing finance company, that's a proxy to real estate, where we sort of originated the idea of real estate or Sundaram Finance's own, uh, you know, financial services, equipment, finance, uh, you know, business, you know, which threw up, over the last three, four years, um, a huge number of wholesale credit opportunities where we felt there is unmet credit need, you know, that banks, et cetera, are not able to finance or not willing to look at, which are clearly big, big opportunities, you know, for private credit funds. Um, and then, you know, we felt that, you know, we should make logical progressions, you know, towards expanding both our product suite as well as the number of funds that we will operate. Uh, so we really think of this as a very sustainable business. It is not a transaction oriented approach for us. So, you know, for us, when we look at a particular product, so real estate, for example, you know, which we launched in 2017 end, um, you know, we are currently raised our third fund, deploying our third fund almost entirely and launching fund four uh, in the middle of May. Uh, so actually speaking in, in a span of five years, you know, we've raised close to 1600 crores of capital. We've deployed close to 2200 crores of capital. We've done over 45 transactions. We've generated 18 to 20 percent returns on a single every deal basis uh you know across that product category we've returned uh you know close to 15 16 percent gross in the hands of investors through everything that you just mentioned you know which is you know all the you know in my opinion cataclysmic events you know where uh, frankly you know other funds were looking at capital losses and we were still distributing cash you know during the moratoriums and the lockdowns uh so i think you know we've been through uh, a fair amount of learning in terms of how does one um, templatize a business, you know, how do you look at risk in terms of addressing a bulk of that through the credit policy? Our parentage really helps in terms of the conservativeness, the governance, etc. Sundaram as a group itself is fairly deep conviction. So every single one of our credit funds has had close to a 20% participation as a sponsor, you know, from Sundaram's, uh, you know, own balance sheet. Uh, so there is deep conviction uh, when we talk about, you know, this is be this being a sustainable business going forward. Um, so from that point of view, we've devised a credit policy uh, in every product that we've launched. So, you know, similar to that, you know, we've launched our corporate credit uh, fund just now uh, in August of last year. As we speak, as you mentioned, you know, we are fundraising for that. Uh, our goal is to raise close to a 750 crores. You know, we're already at a little over 400 crores as we speak. Uh, we've actively started deploying that fund as well. Uh, but in all the strategies that we look at, um, you know, just by way of uh, credit itself as pure credit, um, you know, our business is, you know, fairly templatized. So there are detailed credit policies that go into uh, every fund's uh, product design. So, for example, some of the actually we have we have something called the three pillars. So in the three pillars, the first of it, as you rightly said up front in the conversation is capital protection. So considering the fact that, you know, Sundaram is conservative, committed its own balance sheet. We believe that any investor would look for the same. So all our strategies are oriented around senior secured lending, where we lend at one and a half to two times. 
you know, we look at uh, capital protection, not just from a hard assets point of view, but also in terms of backing businesses that are generating cash flows that we can see. So and effectively, they are all brownfield entries, visible cash flows, stickiness of uh, customers, uh, been in existence for a while. So largely performing credit, uh, you know, sort of bucket and not going into early stage venture or late stage stress distressed. Uh, but the idea is to be backed by both assets as well as running cash flows, you know, which will service our loan and pay us back. Uh, the second pillar that we look at is consistent yield or annuity type returns to our investors. You know, considering the fact that, you know, we are asking investors to lock up capital, you know, for, you know, five years and six years, uh, we only felt it is fair that, you know, we should distribute capital every quarter. So almost 100% uh, of our transactions, you know, are current yield oriented where we get paid interest every quarter. Uh, we charge an upfront fee. So it is very, very typical to a bank type loan uh, or an NBFC type loan from an RBI oversight perspective. So in the idea is to run an NBFC business type structure from a fund where we get paid a quarterly interest, which we distribute 100 percent to our investors. Uh, in addition, every single deal that we do is amortizing. So just because we have a fund structure, you know, we don't get into things like back ended repayments, bullet repayments. Uh, you know, back-ended redemptions, you know, where funds typically try to structure, uh, you know, three-year redemptions to structure for tax and so on. So, you know, regulations have shown us that if you structure for tax, uh, you can get pretty badly hurt. Uh, and investors suddenly, you know, invest thinking that, you know, they're going to get the benefit of indexation or the benefit of long-term capital gains. And if there is a regulatory change, God forbid, um, you know, then, you know, everybody is left with, uh, you know, significant leakage of returns. Uh, but simultaneously, the concept of current yield and annuity, it is not just a compensation for locking up liquidity. Also, from a risk perspective, uh, we feel that, you know, if we invest in a portfolio which is consistently running down, amortizing, generating cash to be able to service our loans, from a risk point of view, you know, considering the global uncertainties, the volatility, the the more the frequency with which, you know, sort of significant events, you know, in terms of mark, being market disruptive are happening, you know, all of those are, um, uh, you know, happening at a stage where we believe that from an asset quality or a risk perspective, you know, we'd like to consistently start running down our loans where we believe that we are consistently reducing the risk from the underlying portfolio every quarter. Uh, but to compensate for the rundown of the portfolio and consistently being able to compound returns for our investors, our fund architecture also has a capital recycling, uh, you know, sort of feature. So where we, as soon as we get interest, we of course distribute it to our investors 100%. But the principal portion up to a certain period of the fund, let's say on a six year fund up to four years and on a five year fund up to three years, which is really the investment reinvestment period, we want to recycle that capital. So the benefit of recycling the capital is twofold for our investors. One is the fact that, you know, the, the 17, 18% on the portfolio is consistently getting generated over a longer duration while being risk mitigated from each deal running down and not really staying on balance sheets very long where the promoter diverts capital goes into other end users and then you know shows up for a restructuring and so on so we would take care of risk on the one end you continue distribution of income on the other hand but at the same time you know you find deals to be able to recycle capital to keep that compounding as far as the fund uh, annuity or uh, nominal or invested capital goes so the goal is that by the end of the fund tenor you've not just generated, you know, 15, 16, 17% return, you know, which is where our funds are running at today, but you're also from a, a absolute return point of view or a multiple of invested capital, as it is called in the industry, you know, you're somewhere between 1.5 to two times, you know, which is honestly over the last 20 years, what 95% of the private equity funds have delivered. So the idea is that, you know, when we look at making a go to market pitch to our investors, you know, we're not just addressing the credit angle where we're saying that, you know, we're going to create a diversified portfolio of senior secured loans, which is going to pay you consistent return and interest every quarter. But you are also going to go into um, a return, a risk adjusted return profile, you know, which from an IRR point of view, you know, is generating, you know, the high teens between 15 and 17 percent return in the hands of investors. But also from a multiple on invested capital, it is extremely competitive from creating a sort of a hybrid return that mimics private equity type returns. So in any investor, and this is practically the feedback we've received from most of our investors whom we pitched to, they said that, you know, and, and, and as you may know, uh, Kamal, most investors in India have historically had one of two options, right? One on the one hand, they've gone into public uh, equities, you know, which continues to be the mainstay uh, where it's, a, you know, direct, it's perceived as a direct reflection of, you know, how India is doing and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, you know, they've gone into debt mutual funds or 
government securities, AAA, and so on and so forth. So there are very few sort of alternate investment avenues. You know, let's say between 2000 and you know 2016, 17. You know, which have emerged. Uh, you know, as alternatives. So there is still a massive equity mindset from an investor perspective. Um, you know, so increasingly over the last five years, we've seen that investors have sat up and taken notice that okay. If I'm generating on a risk adjusted and over a long term basis, a 15, 16 percent return from public equities, uh, if there is a debt product, you know, with consistent annuity and yield, which is capable of generating a similar IRR for me uh, for part of my portfolio, why do I not want to allocate a little bit of money to it? So we've seen investor allocations within their portfolios in our own funds go up, you know, from about two, three percent when we started way back in 2017 to close to 15 to 20 percent. You know, as we speak, as part of investor portfolios into credit funds, not just ours, but you know, various other participants in the market as well. So essentially, it has emerged as a pretty interesting asset class where we base our funds on capital protection, consistent yield, reducing risk on a diversified senior secure portfolio, and risk-adjusted returns vis-a-vis -vis what fixed income is perceived at in the market. You know, so many investors, when I go and you know tell them that hey, uh, we're actually delivering private equity returns, if you see. They go back and say, oh, no, 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 but, you know, uh, the private equity return on a 10 year fund uh, where you're expected to take duration risk as well has not yet finished. So there may be some sixers in the portfolio and I could get to, you know, three, four X. But by and large, many funds, uh, any, many investors you know, have begun to realize that if a fund can intelligently recycle capital, which is what we are seeking to do, you know, you can actually not just make IRR, but you can actually make a pretty decent multiple of invested or absolute return as well on a portfolio. So considering this, uh, Kamal, our funds currently, uh, we run four funds. So we have three real estate funds, one of which is fully paid back, two funds running, you know, it's currently running investor level returns of 17 and close to, you know, 15 and a half percent, you know, the, the 15 and a half percent is literally close six months back. So, you know, that we think will move up to 17 percent. Both of these are real estate. You know, we are uh, launching fund four, as I told you. Uh, you know, which is expected to be between 700 and 1,000 crores. Uh, we will launch that in mid-May. We have city approvals. Uh, we also uh, have launched uh, the first uh, tranche or first series of our mid-market corporate lending fund, which we are calling the Emerging Corporate Credit Opportunities or ECHO Fund, uh, where the logic and the principles of the fund are exactly what I went through, where we will be targeting investments um, into companies which are performing credit, uh, been in existence for a while, no history of uh, you know defaults and so on clean balance sheets visibility of cash flows but from a turnover point of view you know between let's say 150 crores to 1000 crores where over the last 12 to 13 years we've systemically seen corporate scheduled banks you know which are the lowest cost capital providers in the country unwilling to look at these kind of companies unless you have an existing banking relationship and you know banks are preferring to lend to much larger companies let's say you know 1500 to 3000 4000 crores chunkier exposures. So there is a whole vacant space as far as, you know, small MSME and SME companies, as we call it in our world, uh, which are starving for credit, but are growing and absolutely need growth capital. So either their options are either to go to public markets where they are too small and too early or go to private equity where they are not yet ready from a cultural standpoint to be able to share uh, shareholders agreements with people who expect very high levels of governance. So historically, they've either gone to, um, you know, sort of market money lenders you know or you know try to struggle you know through accruals and have lower rates of growth so with the emergence of private credit funds we think that you know their growth capital needs you know can be addressed you know they are viable as companies to be able to lend into uh, and the second portion of the demand driver for private credit funds in general is also the regulatory arbitrage where clearly rbi has come up and encouraging banks um, or restricting banks from lending into situations which are considered speculative. So, for example, acquisition financing, share backed financing, refinancing and giving top ups to address enterprise level mismatches, last mile capex, corporate reorganizations. There are about eight to 10 regulatory end users that are restricted by RBI for banks to lend towards. So, these are substantial in nature. And between the smaller companies that, you know, all private credit funds are targeting and the regulatory sort of end use restrictions. Uh, we think the opportunity is anywhere between, you know, 15 to 20,000 crores as a credit demand annually, um, as far as India is concerned. But of course, you know, I've been on panels, you know, which you yourself have hosted, you know, with, uh, you know, other worthy competitors, uh, you know, whether it's ICICI Pru, whether it's True North, 
uh, bearings, which is the largest in the business, um, where they believe the opportunity is anywhere between 40 to 50,000 crores in terms of annual credit unmet demand. So the opportunity is massive. Now, why is it so massive? Um, is also because of the way the capital structure in the country is organized. Um, you know, this is worthwhile for the audience to understand. So in a developed market like the US, uh, if one looks at how purely the debt side of the capital structure is organized, you know, roughly uh, 20 to 25 percent of the needs of uh, wholesale credit are met by banks. And the balance 75 to 80 percent are actually met by non banks, you know, but they may be private credit funds. Uh, you know, they may be off market funds, you know, they are, you know, numerous types of entities that are able to lend in the US, you know, being one of the largest and the deepest capital markets in the world. Uh, but if you see the similar uh, percentage in India, in terms of how our capital structure is organized, it's exactly the opposite. Roughly 80 to 85% of wholesale credit needs have historically been met by banks, you know, ranging from uh, high risk capital needs of promoter equity, you know, to last mile capex and rescue capital and everything historically have been banks and the balance have been non-bank, you know, whether they, whether they are the NBFCs, you know, smaller credit funds, you know, private lenders and so on. So over the last eight years, this percentage of 85-15 has, in our opinion, perhaps, you know, become more 75-25 or 80-20. So a 75-85 or an 80-20 has suddenly given birth, you know, to a 3 lakh crore industry. You know, that's the way we look at it. So, you know, if for every percentage point change in the capital structure organization of the country, the opportunity for private credit funds is multifold, you know, billions of dollars. So the uh, assessment of 40 to 50,000 or in Sundaram's case, you know, being from the south and, you know, so on and so forth in a relatively safe attitude, even 15 to 20,000 crores is a massive number. So essentially, uh, from that perspective, the opportunity is huge. Uh, but obviously, within that, there are different styles, different strategies you know, that, uh, you know, different fund managers use, you know, for example, um, you know, Vivriti and Northern Arc, you know, which are highly prevalent and, uh, you know, I have deep respect for them, largely operate in financial services. You know, they have beautifully disintermediated the space. Um, and there are funds like, uh, you know, bearings, which look at mid-market credit like us. And then there is, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, venture debt companies, you know, whether it's Trifecta, um, you know, Unify or so on. You know who look at early stage you know they have competencies to be able to understand that risk uh, so, you know there is a variety of investment opportunities and avenues based on the risk thresholds um, and what typically investors look at you know as increasingly allocating to in their portfolio but we've generally seen that investors uh, particularly when we started this conversation we talked about debt mutual funds and flight of capital uh, typically people who have invested in debt mutual funds have either taken a rates call um, to park monies or they have taken some form of credit quality call in terms of, you know, AAA and so on. So we, it is logical to expect that those guys would find their way into funds like us, you know, which deal with corporate credit um, and which have templatized the business, you know, which focus on capital protection, which is similar to what they want to hear on a debt mutual fund. Um, and, you know, our underwriting policy and the fact that there is substantial skin in the game um, and our track record, you know, of not having lost a single rupee of capital over these last five years. Uh, in in a perceived risky sector like even a real estate, um, you know, is is something that our investors have liked, and and for that reason, you know, roughly uh, thirty to forty percent of every fund uh, sees exactly the same investors reallocating uh, from fund to fund uh, for us, uh, and we think that that universe is growing um, as far as a franchise is concerned. So, um, I've said a lot, but you know, just to summarize, um, our funds are characterized from a fund philosophy standpoint as uh, seen as secured lending, you know, which protects capital, consistent yield that runs down risk, as well as able to offer income distributions on closed ended funds, which is really what AI funds are about. Um, and risk adjusted returns, you know, we've generated in the investors' hands gross anywhere between 15 to 17 and net between 12 and a half to 15 percent. Uh, you know, this is post fees pre tax. Um, you know, so, you know, we are clearly anywhere, you know, between a 300 to 500 basis points premium. So, typically, what a uh, a debt mutual fund, uh, you know, was historically able to generate. And in today's context of uh, taxation, you know, they will be able to, that alpha will be even greater. So I noticed that, you know, as I was speaking, there is, uh, you know, a lot of uh, questions, you know, that sort of popped up. Uh, should I address some of those so that, you know, we are contextual right now? So we can, we can address maybe subsequently. We will do that. Okay. So you have actually covered, you know, big picture. 
and uh, from investors point of view i would like to ask you a few questions which you know investors would have on their minds mm -hmm. first of all uh, you know though i agree that from industry point of view obviously there's a massive opportunity and then that that opportunity is what you through your funds are going to capitalize but basically you know why is it that any mid stage uh, company would leave a bank and borrow from a fund like you at 17 18 20% why is that the uh, sure. that sure sure so I, i just want to be very clear banks are the lowest cost capital providers in the country period so anywhere where the bank capital is available uh, is not a potential business for us so none of our borrowers will given an option of a bank financing to address a similar end use borrow money from us at 17 18 you are 100% correct okay so i want to uh, uh, i did mention a little bit of this earlier so the situations that we encounter are companies which perhaps do not have an existing banking relationship let's just start with this three scenarios broadly i mean there are many but for the sake of this conversation and to be brief i would say there are three scenarios where our businesses or our funds or funds like us you know are competitive one where existing businesses do not have banking relationships and it is going to take them time because breaking into a bank which hitherto does not have a relationship is a process uh, and that is how the credit appraisal systems of banks are set up they look for a lot of comfort around uh, historical track record name uh, stature and so on and so forth you know so given a choice banks have deepest respect for banks uh but their credit call would be why don't we just lend 500 crores to an adani uh rather than lend 50 crores to 10 companies you know which are 250 crores uh you know is clearly the view uh that you know banks have today so to break into a bank uh, where you comfort them on your track record your reputation as a promoter uh the ability to provide collateral because the banking system is still oriented around you know hard assets and collateral based lending um and then to say on top of that that yeah i have the cash flows to be able to service you as well and so on and so forth it's a process i'm not saying companies won't get there but they are growing at such a pace uh, that they may not have time to spend a year with banks to be able to cultivate so essentially they come to us at a stage where they are growing they are institutionalized they have a cap capability to absorb 40 to 50 crores of capital uh, which is typically the deal size that we do you know which is 8 to 10% of the fund um and say that okay look let's take this money let's use it for our growth capital let's get to a stage where i'm able to build a relationship with the bank so that does two things for us as well as the company one is the company itself grows in stature and we develop refinancing options where he borrows capital at a cheaper cost and is very happy to take our capital out so in against our 17 18 he's borrowing at 12 13 and that is you know great for him and for us because remember that you know we also recycle capital so i'd much rather go into uh another company rather than throttle that borrower at 17 18% and hurt his balance sheet the second scenario where uh, we are competitive is regulatory arbitrage in terms of end use so remember i mentioned six or seven end uses like acquisitions uh reorganizations um last mile capex uh, refinancing of an existing bank where there is a cash flow mismatch at the enterprise level and there are four or five other further end uses where banks do not lend Uh, regardless of you know uh, how good the company is because they are regulatorily restricted uh, you know from by the rbi from uh, lending towards these end users so there we become very very competitive but again you know these kind of end users are for example a, a company will do an acquisition digest it probably take 18 to 24 months maybe 3 years and they start to generate the optimal level of cash flows either accelerate repayments or prepayments back to us you know or are able to find cheaper forms of bank financing second situation right the third is a situation where uh there is an existing lender on a bank right so i'm go i'm going in sequence of probability of, of deals as well you know this is really how our pipeline is configured also uh, the third is where there is an existing bank um but you know there is a situation where the existing bank has either maxed out in terms of their lending matrix uh in terms of ratios and so on and so forth and the way they look at it um or they're not able to offer more working capital uh you know or a form of financing that the guy wants um so i noticed some questions around uh, whether the promoter needs to put more equity uh, you know in, in order to bridge an actual cash generating contract that is actually there by the way everything i am telling you are actual life scenarios in terms of deals that we're seeing and i'll give a few examples after i finish so essentially those are situations where we go in where there is an existing bank we as sundaram lend 
only on an exclusive basis. So we want our own security. We don't want to be pari pasu. Uh, you know, we want identified cash flows that are liened and hypothecated to us. But there is other lenders uh, don't want to take names who are quite happy uh, to lend on a pari pasu basis. You know, where there are other lenders, as long as they're able to get their return. So in our view, uh, we want to be in control of our destiny, in control of our security, in control of our cash flow, uh, and that's how we do business. Uh, but there is no one shoe fits all. Um, and there are different styles of managers, but essentially these are three scenarios where private capital is required, not capable of uh, getting uh, capital from banks. And for that reason, you know, there is an alpha uh, between what the banks can lend at, even to a mid market company, let's say it's between 12 and 14, you know, the premiums we're talking about, you know, are let's say between 15 and 18%. Uh, you know, bear in mind that, you know, bulk of the private credit industry also is lending at 13 to 15% where They've chosen, um, you know, again, I don't want to take names, but you know, there are, these are offshoots of banks where they believe that where their own bank cannot lend, um, you know, the fund can actually go and lend. Um, you know, these are extensions of banks. So essentially, they believe that they can go and manage a risk and a promoter on a 13 to 15% financing. But in our view, uh, the math for us uh, from an investor standpoint doesn't work out because if we are lending at 13 to 15 and we minus the asset management costs and so on and so forth, you know, you're, you're ending at a pre-tax return of closer to 10%. So if you apply the tax rate, which is in an AIF category two, it's a tax pass through and whatever tax rate applies to that investor will apply to the income from the fund. So, you know, assuming that it's a one crore investor with a maximum marginal rate of 39%, you know, you're ending up with a 6% post-tax rate. In today's context, post the debt mutual fund, that might also make sense. But the way we look at it is that on a sustainable basis, there must be an alpha. You know to typically you know what uh, uh, as i said uh, fixed income universe can generate so we'd like to be at a pre-tax return of somewhere around 13 to 14 percent uh, so you know we lend at 17 18 and minus all the charges a little bit of treasury leakages some time to do workouts and so on and so forth so we've imputed you know some sort of uh, formula which has largely worked out you know on the three funds that we've done in the past we think that our ability to target a 13 14 percent return post all charges and leakages is something that the market is actually offering, especially in an inflationary world with rising rates and so on. So if you apply a tax rate, you know, you're still closer to 10% from post-tax return, which is a substantial premium and an alpha to where uh, typical fixed income returns are. So uh, how, why the, why the uh, promoter is able to borrow at these rates is because the business is able to afford it. So you know, typically we write loans of four to five years. So, and I'll give you some examples, right? I mean, of what I've just talked about. So, you know, we are currently discussing with a digital media company uh, in uh, based out of Chennai. You know, it's about 350 to 400 crores. Um, it's doing 30 to 50 crores of uh, 40 to 50 crores of EBITDA. Uh, there is no other debt other than a HDFC bank packing credit uh, of about 50 crores, which renews uh, every six months. This is a company in the business of providing those messaging services. So all the messages that you get on a fixed income or a fixed deposit rate increase, uh, please avail of the offer sooner than later. All of those messaging services is what they manage. So these are long-term contracts, you know, with HDFC Bank, Karur Vaishya, Tata Digital. Uh, so marquee customers, uh, six to nine year contracts where there's stickiness of cash flows, stickiness of customer uh, ability for us to have diligenced a long range of cash flows having, you know, come into the business. So this company is looking at 40, 50 crores to invest in uh, more infrastructure to be able to pitch to other similar customers. So it is interesting for us, you know, that banks and NBFCs were struggling to analyze this company because A, they felt that, oh, this is a digital media company. How sticky are they? They don't have manufacturing assets. They don't have hard assets. It's not a brick and mortar business. Ability of the promoter to offer, um, of the business to offer hard assets, uh, you know, is limited and so on. We came in and actually given them, of course, you know, we are in diligence right now, but I'm just trying to give our audience an assessment of what kind of opportunities can come about where, you know, we are looking at around 18% IRR, 15.5% coupon. It's a five-year transaction with a uh, four-year or duration because remember, we do everything on an amortizing basis, quarterly interest pay. And we've said, in, we've said that we are going to hypothecate or lien the cash flows from HDFC Bank and uh, Tata Digital which on an annual basis is around 75 crores with an upsize potential to go up to 125 crores. So on a 50 crore facility, you know, which is amortizing, uh, we have ample cash flow that is coming through our escrow account, you know, which we can sweep at any time, you know, towards our loan. And we think that while we are writing a four year duration trade, uh, the cash flows are actually going to pay us or prepay us back in 18 to 24 months. 
Uh, so the way I look at it is that, you know, from a risk point of view, we're backing solid cash flows and the promoter has come up with personal assets, you know, close to around 40 odd crores. Um, and so essentially, this is a fantastic risk reward profile. We we're hitting 18 percent, amortizing loan, solid cash flows to back our repayment, skin in the game from the promoter, massive equity value. They currently are close to a 2000 crore equity value and they're fundraising at the parent level, which is in Singapore. So essentially, we think that in 18 to 24 months, you know, we're going to get back money, which that which in that two and a half years, you know, all the income that we get, we distribute to investors as income and that 50 crores, we are in a position to reinvest again, you know, in a similar trade to be able to create that 17, 18 percent again. So this is one example. You know, another example of a deal we've done is an educational services company where we uh, sanctioned 42 crores. This is a deal we've actually done in Bangalore where there are nine schools and colleges, you know, which, which are generating close to 120 crores of cash. Uh, we have four schools and colleges which cumulatively generate about 65 odd crores of cash uh, over the tenor of our loan, which is leaned and hypothecated to us. There's hard assets in Bangalore, tracts of land, which is real assets of close to about 70, 80 crores, which are mortgaged to us. So we have an MODT and a first and sole charge on that asset. This is again a five year deal with a four and a half year duration, 18 percent IRR, 15 and a half coupon with some upfront fee where, you know, we've already disbursed 30 crores. You know, we probably do the next 12 crores over the next month or so. Uh, we think that, you know, again, there's no sense in the promoter sitting on an 18 percent cost when the at the enterprise level he's borrowing at around 11 um, and, and our end use. And the reason why the guy borrowed at 18 percent from us is to refinance an existing NBFC and give a top up uh, cash, you know, to be able to do refurbishments in one of his uh, institutions. So post our deal and post digesting, uh, you know, our, our financing and being able to complete those refurbishments. Each of those institutions is eligible for a project loan from an SBI, for example. Um, so we think that, you know, the guy will prudently in a year or so be able to borrow money and pay us back. Of course, in this case, we negotiated very hard on, you know, you need to hold our capital for at least 18 months because otherwise no point in us getting money back so fast. Uh, but we built in, you know, things like prepayment premiums, etc., to make sure that the IRR to our investors is protected. Uh, but it's a fully secure transaction with a possible upside of getting money back in two, two and a half years. So again, you know, there is a base case underwriting based on cash flow and assets with a credit enhancement where the enterprise itself is at such a stage and there are events, you know, that will incentivize, I won't say force, incentivize promoters to be able to prepay us and say that, let me get rid of this 18 percent, 17, 18 percent cost. And, you know, let me, uh, you know, go into a mainstream financing market. So there are end users and situations like the ones I described, you know, which are available all the time. And we currently run, you know, close to a 600 crore pipeline. Uh, you know, to be able to disperse into transactions like this. So this is the reason why promoters are willing to pay a premium, but they want to hold on to this higher cost of financing for a limited period of time. But it is possible to structure institutionally, you know, if you're disciplined um, and credit oriented, uh, a set of bilateral documents that are making sure that you are uh, seen as secured, you know, you have ample cash flow uh, and you're able to consistently drive down the risk. So, you know, from that point of view, is where our overall ethos of the three pillars that I mentioned in terms of capital protection, the consistency of yields and risk reduction to investors and risk adjusted return emerge. So, you know, this is sort of some of the transactions that are numerous transactions that I can describe like this, you know, which we are going through right now, um, sure. you know, which are uh, interesting. Sure, sure. So, you know, my, my learning over the last two decades of my experience is that quality of your pipeline determines the quality of your portfolio. And you know, your pipeline in terms of uh, value is, you know, quite... I would say awesome. I would want to also understand, you know, that what is the source of your pipeline, you know, and are there any particular sectors which are totally, you know, I would say in, you do not do, or they are in their do, not to do category. Like the two examples you gave of digital marketing company and education services business. How did they come to you or how did you find them? Sure. Uh, so uh, our sourcing is uh, threefold. One is uh, clearly Sundaram. So we get into all businesses with the knowledge that Sundaram as an ecosystem itself has an ability to throw up these transactions. Uh, so many of our transactions come up um, as a logical extension of our business. So, for example, on the real estate side, we had uh, Sundaram Housing, which was uh, approached. I mean, they've been doing home loans for you know two decades. You know, they were consistently approached by uh, developers uh, asking for wholesale financing. Um, and, you know, they were not able to offer that, you know, so that logically uh, we felt that, you know, we had a, a running advantage in terms of hitting the market 
where you know we have existing relationships with more than you know 100 developers in the south where we want to focus or where we do focus um, and in addition to which um, you know we obviously as a team you know we built up a fairly robust team so if you see real estate there are two fund managers three analysts in the case of the echo fund you know we have a, a, a fund manager who's joined us with a great pedigree you know from incred uh, you know he comes with a you know close to 15 years of you know debt investment banking advisory um, you know fund advisory business uh, you know we have three analysts you know who are working for him you know who are able to crunch numbers you know come up with you know things that satisfy our templates and our cc uh, consistently so you know there is a lot of relationships uh, you know that the team itself has in terms of sourcing whether they are with regional intermediaries uh, you know starting with small cas to uh, you know people who focus only on particular markets you know to let's say guys like ernst and young kpmg and so on you know to the investment banks you know whether they are vendors uh, uh, jm uh, edelweiss and so on you know to even you know much larger uh, investment banks you know who uh, you know typically have you know trades you know they they want to show to much larger investors you know but they are in touch with us as well so there is a wide sourcing ecosystem ranging from regional to local to national you know which we are plugged into not just us you know all funds would look at you know similar sourcing uh, in addition to which there is also word of mouth you know so for example it's an interesting uh, thing from a sourcing point of view you know we actually sought out when we started the real estate business we said that uh, you know since we are funding performing credit uh, there is an ability to do repeat deals um, you know with with developers so if you see our portfolio from fund 1 to now fund 4 we think that you know roughly 40% to 45% Uh, of our portfolio are actually repeat transactions with the same developers but on new projects uh, on the real estate context so as the businesses grow as they get into new projects there is a comfort that you build in terms of uh, you know doing repeat transactions in addition to which once you establish comfort and you've dealt fairly uh, you know so we don't aspire uh, you know to, as i said you know to go into a balance sheet and treat this as the last transaction that we do so you know we look at a repeat context and the relationship with the guy so our goal is to do you know two three four transactions with the same guy on different contexts obviously it is not greening one fund to the other and replacing one fund with the other but you know it's a fresh set of risks but with a similar guy because he's growing and he'll have a multiple set of needs where you know he'll increasingly have banking relationships and he'll be able to borrow at lower costs but there'll always be these kind of end users where he will be prefer that you know he comes to us so from that point of view the idea is word of mouth is also something pretty interesting which has emerged for us where uh, our developers have not just uh, come up with follow on transactions but also you know have referred us around the market so uh, a sundaram ecosystem spawning transaction so for example in, in in the echo fund you know sundaram is fundamentally sf is a truck financier you know that has been their roots of course they are in construction equipments consumer durables you know various other spaces but you know there is a fleet operator you know who's a truck operator who's come to us you know he's a 20 year customer of uh, sundara finance and he's come to us and said i have a wholesale credit need that sf cannot fulfill would you guys be open to evaluating a transaction with us now bear in mind this comes with a 20 year history you know with the group um, and you know we financed his first three trucks uh, you know when he started off business 25 years ago so from that point of view there is a lot of stickiness and loyalty uh, you know that he exhibits towards the group you know so that's a very ideal situation and we have a sister company as, as part of the larger tvs group you know there is also breaks india turbo energy you know there are various tvs group companies uh, which also bring domain knowledge in terms of evaluating deals in automotive components precision engineering and so on so we're looking at transactions you know in those spaces as well uh, where they already know the customer for you know 15 20 years as an oem as a supply chain vendor uh, and so on so you know there is always uh, some benefits to approaching uh, an origination this way which we have the second is uh, clearly uh, sourcing networks as i said you know where we are already plugged in as a team um, where uh, i would say a majority of the pipeline emerges from um, and third is of course you know the word of mouth and uh, follow on transactions with existing guys so that's really how our sourcing network is uh, configured so within this it also gives us the benefit i saw some of the questions in terms of ltvs and so on you know we are lending at ltvs of you know anywhere between you know 40 to let's say 55 60% you know one and a half to two times cover um, you know so when we go and ask a promoter for security in terms of hard assets and we don't look at things like plant and machinery and so on so we look at really land buildings real estate and so on as security which is tangible which has value which can have a bit in a downside god forbid um, and so we are asking that and we are also asking for skin in the game so we understand they may not have cash 
but we're asking for promoters to stake you know their personal real estate into trades and so on and then we're saying okay look you know we want a separate lien and an exclusive hypo of cash flows and then of course you know personal guarantees corporate guarantees financial covenants uh, and so on so when you when you ask for this whole laundry list and, and i must say that our credit policy has a few things uh, you know which are you know reasonably non market standard i would say uh, because sundaram comes with the philosophy that you know if you don't get these i better not to take this risk so while some of the other funds uh, from a fund management team point of view you know we've seen that you know they are more aggressive uh, you know to be able to you know do deals uh, we are quite open into saying to your point that you asked 5 uh, minutes ago kamal uh, our conversion rates are sort of 1 in 10 deals you know so we are 8 to 10% conversion so we say a lot of loans so you know you need to have a multiple sourcing network uh, and some level of relationship equity you know to be able to convert even a 1 is to 10 Uh, and so that's really been the conversion statistic on all our funds you know whether it's real estate or on the corporate credit side over the last 6 months so from yes. that point of view this is how we are configured sure sure well said so you know a subsequent question i was just reading the chat also i think the well, now we should be answering questions little shortly because we have to cover sure. almost seven questions right so uh, what is the concentration in the portfolio for 750 crore fund you will be dividing in how many deals so we are, we will do 8 to 10% of the corpus in, in any single deal our sweet spot is 40 to 60 crores so we probably have anywhere between 10 to 12 deals in a fund so that's the the credit diversification that we are seeking so sure. do you have any preferable sectors in mind or it will be deal specific we are sector agnostic in general but we have a preference for sectors because sundaram as an ecosystem has certain strengths whether it's auto comps engineering financial services some parts of logistics um, um and um, um you know of course you know sundaram amc has a mid cap investing background so you know relationship oriented uh, trades of course things to do with uh, financial services also include insurance but aside of the fact we opportunity to look at you know deals in pharmaceutical and healthcare which is a significant focus for us aside of you know opportunistic deals in education and it and, and digital media so we won't be so we won't be doing also by corollary we also won't be doing things uh, you know that are pollutive um, you know things to do with um, so we also are looking to pitch to uh multilat uh, developmental financial institutions impact investors so things to do with alcohol polluting industries uh some parts of epc you know where you know there is a, a government uh, counterparty subcontracting uh, you know revenues government revenues which could be lumpy risky so those kind of things you know we typically won't look at uh, also situations to do with project finance infrastructure large scale infrastructure are eminently bank financeable you know so that again automatically is stuff that we don't look at because the deal size is very large as well as the capital cost that they are seeking is very low any you know uh, i have a pretty preliminary set of numbers that you have in your mind in terms of balance sheet in terms of size you know in terms of value sure. or a pre to approach you you know can a loss making business approach you for uh, getting this kind of financing Uh, so we will look at performing credit as i said so our definition of performing credit which is very much part of our credit policy is that we are not going to be looking at companies beyond a four times debt ebitda so you know that pretty much captures everything uh, so the business has to be generating a certain quantum of revenues and if our deal size is typically between 40 to 50 crores it has to be of a certain scale and you know it cannot be levered beyond a certain point so the four times debt ebitda of course you know we have criteria around revenues as i said between 150 to 1000 crores but you know beyond a four times debt ebitda is something we don't look at that pretty much ensures that we don't get into stress type situations aside of this obviously you know we look at longevity of the business track record of the promoter and so on and so forth sure uh, the fund you know which is this emerging credit corporate opportunities fund will this be lending to real estate companies also or not no, at all no this is uh, for real estate as a risk we have a separate set of funds so this will focus purely on non real estate as a space you know within that you know we have these uh, preferences and biases towards a few sectors so we may take real estate collateral uh, but not only real estate collateral but you know for example land tracts uh, you know some level of you know cash flow uh, from projects and so on but the idea is to focus on business oriented assets uh, you know which are either in manufacturing services um, you know or non real estate in nature call this lending as a distress lending or this is not a distress lending no we are very very clearly saying that you know this is growth lending to performing entities so we will not be taking early stage risk in terms of venture not nor late stage risks in terms of stress distressed 
So this is performing credit where there's visibility of cash flow, the credit assumption and the underwriting is uh, based on the fact that the cash flows are adequate to pay us non-market correlated, you know, so regardless of capital markets and, you know, liquidity events, uh, IPO, no IPO, trade sale, no trade sale, uh, all that is, you know, is inconsequential to us. So, no, we don't do event based financing. We do cash flow based uh, underwriting. And so effectively, the business has to be capable of paying us back, you know, over the tenor of four or five years. So in this, you know, particular AIF, which is Emerging Corporate Credit Opportunities Fund, at what stage are you in terms of drawdown structure? You know, if anybody wants to commit, uh, all of us understand that minimum, you know, commitment is one crore. But what is the first tranche and, you know, what is the schedule of drawdowns? Sure. We are uh, looking to draw down in four tranches of 25% each. At this stage, you know, we've done a first closure of 200 crores in December 22. We will be closing today uh, as we speak on our second closing, you know, which uh, I believe the number is uh, 400 crores and slightly above. So we are going to be 25% drawn um, till the final closure, which is estimated to be the end of June. So beyond that, between June and March 2024, we will be doing the balance three drawdowns of 25% each. Um, so the idea is that from a treasury point of view, we accumulate transactions and draw down that 25% only when we have deals that we can deploy into so that, you know, we don't run a negative return as far as uh, the investor is concerned. And the investor is also able to invest in tranches. So four tranches of 25% each fully drawn down and fully deployed by March 2024 target. We are currently at 25%, which is likely to remain at 25 till the end of June. Right. So while deal structuring, you know, as you mentioned that 100% of whatever coupon comes to the fund is returned back to the investors on a quarterly basis. So is, is that, you know, what adds up to 16% uh, gross and 13.5% net or there's, there's anything which comes as a premium or a lump sum at the time of redemption? Uh, so it is a uh, largely the compounding of the interest, you know, that will result, result in that return. But bear in mind that our coupons range <coughs> between, let's say, 13 and 16%. So minus the asset management fees of, you know, whatever one to 2% or, you know, plus OPEX and so on, you know, we typically think that uh, the return profile on a cash yield basis perhaps can range between 10 and 11% every quarter once the portfolio is fully uh, deployed. Um, the benefit of compounding of our uh, interest rate on the amortizing loan uh, will make up for some of the difference. The other portion of it is the reinvestment that I talked about. You know, where uh, the principal repayments that we get from individual loans is also recycled in similar transactions. So the compounding effect of both coupons on existing loans as well as follow on recycling, you know, will result in that 16 to 17 percent uh, gross and that 13, 13 and a half percent net. And by the way, this has been demonstrated uh, as a return you know, from our real estate credit funds uh, so far. So investors have actually made whatever I'm discussing. So we intend to not reinvent the wheel and follow what we did for the real estate, even on the corporate lending part. Absolutely. Right. So now you can maybe you know address some of the questions. There is this question: Is it secure lending, or mix of secure and unsecure? If secure, then do we yeah. do so let me just go. Yeah. Let me just go through this. So I think uh, so. It is a hundred percent secured portfolio. So our goal is, uh, as I said right up front, uh, Kamal, if we are looking to replicate a risk of a typical fixed income universe, you know, where either there is a AAA rating, you know, or there is a secured investment. Uh, the goal is to build a portfolio of all senior secured loans, which are backed by hard assets and cash flow. So we will be doing zero unsecured. And the idea is within that to have amortizing portfolios, you know, which will as one portfolio uh, as a fund, you know, be able, uh, you know, to have a diversified risk where uh, you know, every quarter there is an income return. And so the investor is really comforted that, you know, we are not taking any risks, which is beyond what we are stating in our investment mandate and as part of our credit policy. So, you know, when we, when all investors look at us, what they like about us is the fact that, you know, we run a templatized business. So there is no fund manager discretion uh, and ability to waiver, you know, from, you know, whatever is the set credit policy, which by definition, um, you know, when it comes up to the investment committee, you know, should have uh, security, which is hypothecated, sole charge, uh, amortizing structures and quarterly cash pay. So the structure, the security, the stage of entry, the financial covenants, the balance sheet, 
uh, filters, everything, you know, is already preset. Uh, so in a sense, there is very limited, if not zero ability, you know, for the fund management team uh, to stray from that and do something, you know, unique and different. So that way the portfolio is very homogenous um, and, and all deals should exhibit similar risk rewards. Sure. So let's now address, you know, some of the basic questions like, you know, uh, Mr. Srivastava is asking if someone invests in the first week of April, what will be the first quarterly coupon? So essentially, uh, every investor will start receiving coupons from the quarter that follows his investment. But obviously, the quantum of coupon uh, depends on the way the portfolio is constructed. So, you know, once a portfolio is fully constructed, the numbers that I said in terms of, you know, 10 to 11 percent quarterly cash compounding to, you know, a 13 percent, uh, you know, post fee return uh, at the end of the fund is something that will play out. So, as I said, you know, we're also going to be taking a year. Anybody, you know, take a year to deploy that portfolio fully. But uh, the fund is structured in such a way that every money that is drawn is sought to be invested immediately in some uh, performing asset. So every coupon that is generated is 100 percent distributed. So some form of income will start in the quarter that follows the investment. But once the portfolio reaches its uh, optimum level of uh, deployment, uh, then the numbers uh, you know, start to get meaningful. So from a cash in cash out, which is one of the other questions uh, you know, that I saw, uh, our goal as a fund is to target. And by the way, whatever I'm saying, you know, we've demonstrated on the real estate side um, is you know, a six year fund uh, by the end of four years, which is really the investment and reinvestment cycle of the fund. Uh, we should be anywhere between 50 to 65 percent return from a capital point of view, purely from an income point of view. So the income which is upfronted. Uh, which is business income in terms of taxation so we don't structure for tax so even every rupee of income that an investor gets is taxed you know in, in, as at the rate of tax that is applicable to him or her uh, but the goal is from a cash perspective 50 to 65 percent of every crore you know that uh, you know is is given you know is returned in the first four years purely as income from then on uh, it, the capital distribution starts uh, between year four, five, and six, end of year four, year five, and year six. So that as a multiple of invested capital, um, you know, the investor can look at not just an IRR, but as I said, anywhere between 1.5 to 1.8 times multiple of invested capital as well. So that's how the cash flow profile, you know, will look to an investor. So uh, most of our investors have received the benefit of uh, the current income and they've chosen to recycle into funds you know, where, uh, you know, we launch every successive year as well. So that's how they've typically done. But of course, you know, that is the prerogative of the investor. But that's how the cash profile will look. And that's how the income works. Sure, Karthik. So now we'll maybe take, you know, one last question uh, where I want you to explain the entire fee structure. And I would like to kind of request everyone in the audience, you know, who seriously want to look at this fund to maybe go to our platform, PMSAF World. Uh, you know, I'm giving you this option because it is your choice, but uh, we are one of the finest platforms in this space of alternatives. We manage more than 600 crores of assets across around 330 clients. And we have very in-depth understanding of this particular space, be it, you know, category two private equity funds or, you know, credit, credit, uh, credit funds. And hence, in that context, uh, we may not be able to answer your questions uh, in this one hour format. You know, your questions uh require one-on-one -on -one conversations and that is where we would want you to book your appointments with us and we are more than happy to address all your questions through our expertise and the foremost and the i think most important question that we cannot miss you know amongst all the questions which are remaining in the chat box which i see pertains to the fee structure so that is something you know which needs to be addressed you know we had set one hour for it we are already 10 minutes kind of delayed so before we end this particular session I would want you to cover the particular aspect on the fee structure. Sure. Uh, so our fee structure is in three parts in terms of how the investment manager will get paid. The first, like everybody else, is a asset management fee that ranges between one to two percent based on the capital that is contributed. And we have those ratchets, one to five crores, five to ten crores, ten to twenty five and beyond, uh, where the higher the capital committed, the lower the fee. The second aspect of it is an OPEX, you know, which is actual expenses incurred on audit, custodian r and and so on, which is capped at 0.5, but charged to the investor on actuals. So it will, uh, you know, be that or slightly lesser. And then the third pro portion is a carry or a profit sharing, which is back-ended towards the end of the fund, where if we deliver post the fees uh, that we charge to an investor beyond a hurdle rate of 12%, then only to the extent of the incremental, let's say, you know, we come to 13%, which is what I've been saying, 
to the extent of 1%, which is the difference between 13 and 12, we will charge a 20% profit sharing towards the end of the fund that's back ended. So effectively, that's, you know, 20 bips. So that's usually on a fixed income fund fairly small. But the idea is that, you know, we make money when the investor makes money. There is no catch up to that. And I also noticed, you know, there is a, you know, a, a setup fee, which is, uh, you know, payable. But, you know, we can we are amenable to discussing that, you know, based on the capital commitments that investors have. Uh, so that's typically how it works. So principally, it's an asset management fee that is charged on a quarterly basis, which is an annual cost of between one and two. Then there is an OPEX, uh, which is on actual costs. And then there is a back-ended at the end of the fund profit sharing beyond generation of a hurdle of 12 post fee. So that, that's typically how it is. So if you actually add all of what I just said, the range is between two and a half and three uh, percent maximum. So, you know, when we are looking at a portfolio uh, level uh, value or a return creation of 17, 18, you know, your returns typically uh, tend to be between, you know, 14 and 15. And I noticed another question in terms of delinquencies and provisioning and so on. Uh, where we believe that there is a one to one and a half. We have not lost any a single rupee of capital across 2,300 crores of uh, deals that we have done over a very difficult vintage, as we discussed an hour ago. Uh, but despite that, you know, we have a delinquency provision, you know, with the internal to the company uh, around one, one and a half percent, which is why I'm saying if you knock those off, our target returns are between 13 to 14 percent post fee. So, you know, that's how we get to that 13, 14 so much Karthik and I thank you know all our clients and the entire audience uh, we had more than 300 people attending this webinar I'm really sorry if we have not been able to cover all the questions that's why I reiterate you are most welcome to you know fix appointments with us I see many clients of ours who have joined today so I would request you to kindly you know connect with us we'll be happy to answer all your unanswered questions and we can also do one-on-one -on -one, you know uh, I would say zoom meetings where Karthik can be again uh, I would say uh, invited uh, to answer to your unanswered questions. This is a one hour format. And I think, you know, we have been able to add uh, immense value uh, by covering what was uh, aspired in this session. And again, I thank you all who have joined us today to have attended this webinar. And thank you, Karthik, for taking uh, taking time. I think this was very uh, good webinar in terms of learning, uh, you know, great information. We have uh, deep insights uh, about Sundaram because many of our clients are already invested into it. And we have seen, you know, practically uh, the experience of those clients. And that's what kind of drives us, us to kind of do uh, this webinar with you, because we are very worried of advising our clients, especially in this space of debt. We do not want, you know, investors to have any unforeseen experience where they do not, they are not wanting to take any, any risk. And that's kind of, you know, uh, uh, makes us confident about uh, you as a fund manager. And again, I thank you, everyone. Thanks once again. Bye. Thanks, Kamal. I just uh, you know, really appreciate the session and the time and the patient hearing that you've given me. Sorry if I extended my uh, mandate by a little, but I couldn't resist uh, seeing Mr. Amandeep Singh Valia's comment. And I would say just in closing that, you know, we haven't missed a single quarter's income distribution, sir, uh, on any of our real estate funds to date over the last five years. With that, I'd love to have a uh, one-on-one -on -one chat, as Kamal suggested. Thank you so much for this evening's session. My pleasure. Thank you.